Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, welcome back to the church and for the, coming to our evening service. Please stand with me, and we're going to start off by singing number 120, 120, and we will do all four of those verses. Good evening. Good evening. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the day you've given us, and thank you, Lord, that we're able to come here again this afternoon to worship you and to hear your word spoken. Lord, we thank you for what's taken place here in this sanctuary today with the uh, funeral for Shirley. Those that turned out, they heard the, heard God's word and the uh, how people just uh, shared 
what Shirley meant to them. We thank you. For, we're so thank, thankful for that, Lord. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for loving us. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Uh, a couple announcements I have. First of all, uh, Jerry and I was in Kentucky last week at the conference up there, the uh, Truth Matters Conference. And we didn't know it, but we had people looking for us. <laughs> Watching the conference on television, kept saying, wonder where they're setting at. But we were there. So uh, anyway, just picking. Uh, Tuesday, if you haven't signed up, want to go to Strawberry Hill down in Chesney, South Carolina, make sure you sign that sheet up tonight, on that sheet tonight. I will be picking that up. And uh, we'll leave Tuesday morning about 930 and go down for lunch and just a time of fellowship. Maybe some, doing some raining, you know, that's fine. We'll go and have a good time. Also... Uh, there's still I still have a couple rooms left for October to go up to the Amish country if you are interested in that to see me. So, okay, thank you. Okay. All right, the next one is 137, and we'll do all three of those verses. Thank you, ladies. Boy, that is a good last line of that verse. Lord, don't me, let me outlive my love for you. That, um, I hope you know what you're praying there. If you uh, get what you want out of that, you're asking for an early death if uh, your love is short-lived. I have a few books to give away, and then Pastor Randy, you come on and uh, share with us that missions trip report. This is coming from page 25 of uh, Nine Marks publication called How to Build a Healthy Church. Listen to the subtitle, A Practical Guide for Deliberate Leadership. This is, again, coming from uh, the bottom of page 25. What does deliberate mean? Well, it means, of course, well thought out through uh, or well thought out carefully. When it says a practical guide to deliberate leadership, what we're trying to be careful about as church leaders then is building the church on and around the gospel of Christ. More specifically, we are trying to be careful about building our church according to the pattern that God has given us in Scripture. At its best, the deliberate church is careful to trust the Word of God, wielded by Jesus Christ to do the work of building the local church. It is an attempt 
to put our money where our mouth is when we say that we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture for the life, health, and growth of the local church. Listen to this. Our goal isn't to see how innovative we can be. Our goal is to see how faithful we can be. That's what it means to build deliberately a local church. I have three copies of that to give away. Who would like to have them? Okay, Helton, and then Phil, and then Rolf. Great. You're up. Okay. Mickey, is Tim here? Okay. Randy, do you have a video ready to show? Okay. Well, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did Operation In As Much, and Tim, and uh, let's see here. Wayne Evans helped him find some projects, and he was, uh, and so we, they worked that Saturday at several different locations. Uh, first of all, one of the places they work is uh, the, two, the trailer parks on both sides of the road at the end here of Cool Park Road. Uh, did several things there. There was also a couple other churches there doing some other things. They were picking up trash and cleaning as our group was working. So we had about 53, 54 people show up that day and work there. They worked down at one of our church members' homes down in uh, down here. Uh, uh, mine went blank. That's Fence Road. Thank you. And so they went down there, they done some pressure washing and uh, cleaned the house, built the deck. Over here in the trailer parks, there was a deck built. Uh, some of you folks here helped do that. There was some windows replaced. And so, uh, yeah, we got some videos shown here. There's other folks here, let me show on the video, that are doing some feeding there. There were some gardens planted there. Uh, they went out, I think six or seven gardens were planted over to trailer park. Uh, this is down off of Spencer Road. They built the deck, pressure washed the house. Uh, I think that we had a pretty good turnout of the of, of folks that day to show up. One of the things that they did was uh, also we went down here in the trailer park, the closest one to the church here off Cold Park Road, and some of you fixed hamburgers or hot dogs and handed those out. And from that, we have a family, I don't know if they're here tonight, they were here this morning, that has started coming. Uh, they've got three, two little boys and a little month old baby and have a lot of questions. So they've met with Pastor Bill a little bit and discussed, so they've been coming. And so uh, just getting out and, and doing this work in, this, in these trailer parks and the areas that we need to do these has been... Uh, really good we, this is about the fifth or sixth year we've done that and so a lot of a lot more comes out of that than we anticipate so here comes mr tim i'm gonna let him come on up here and talk a little bit about this he he headed it up uh if you if you're in here and you help with operation in as much just stand up real quickly if you would just stay take take us to stand up and show show that we and this is not all it's a couple of you are not standing up back there so, uh, and I know you were there. So, it's a, it was a lot going on. So, Tim, I'm going to let you go here. So, you kind of headed this up and you can talk a little bit about that. Well, sorry I wasn't here. I was at the hospital. So, anyway, sorry about that, but we made it. Yeah. Well, as Randy said, we, we had a lot of projects going on that day. I think there were 12 of them. And they ranged from putting windows in homes to tearing porches off, putting porches back. Uh, Fixing food for for a trailer park uh, down this route down the street, Lake Lake Hickory Mobile Home Park, but most of the work concentrated over at Cool Park. Uh, most of it did, and then I think we worked at uh, Janice Granger's home, put a uh, new porch on the back house of her house, and we also put uh, we have I don't know if we got pictures or not of Randy and them on top of her carport, washing pressure washing her home and. Uh, I can't tell you how many times she came up and she said, I can't believe what God's done for me today. She was just so happy, and uh, we were so glad to get to be able to, to serve her that night. She's been here many, many years, and, and so she doesn't have any family left uh, to help her, and so that was, a, that was a blessing to be able to do that with her. Um, but most importantly, we touched a lot of people's hearts with what we were able to go out and, and do. Lord, Lord led us to these specific homes for a specific reason. And some of that's already showing up uh, with the ladies coming 
to some of the ladies' meetings now. Uh, had a family uh, just today had been coming from the old home park right down the street, and they asked what they needed to do to be a member. And uh, he wants to change his family's lives. He, he wants to better their lives. And what more way can you do that than turning your family to Christ? And uh, so we just, we just, uh, we're just thankful that we were able to, to do that, that God gave us the means to do it. And the folks that showed up, I think there's, I don't remember, 70-some maybe. They helped in total. And uh, it was just a great day, it was just a great day. Um, what else, Penny, could I add to that? I just can't tell well, you. If you're giving to the 1052, that yeah. money for all this, all this that you've seen, the decks built, uh, the, the flower boxes, uh, the soil, everything come, that money comes from the 1052. So right. if you're participating in the 1052 uh, missions fund each week that we ask that you do, that's where that money comes from. So you're helping to provide for that. And so uh, quite possibly this fall we'll do something again. We've been asked, uh, I was asked by a gentleman at high, or my wife was, and friends we have at Highland, if we could do a combination of the two churches to do some kind of another outreach in our community, maybe a little bit bigger or something like that. So if you're participating in 1052, you're part of this outreach. Yeah. And you don't have to be skilled, right, Ken? That's right. We, we can teach you or... You, you can do many things. Some of those were pr just prayer walks, walking through the walking through those parks, just praying for those folks, each trailer individually. I think Tommy and Sally went out and did that one day. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, we've got Bible school coming up. Those folks know about Bible school now. Uh, we're going to redistribute literature to them for that. And uh, it's just, the, like I say, the 1052 is our missions fund that we have here. And it goes so far. It, it, we're so blessed to have that here and. It was not like that from where I came from, I tell you. And uh, God, is, God has got his hand on us here, and I, we're praying that he continues to do that. Um, and, but it takes people to just go work and do the things that God asks you to do. So don't turn down an opportunity ever. God will use you in, in many ways, so many ways. If you can just pray, just pray for those, that missions to be, those missions to be carried out. And it's just a blessing to get to be able to do it. Uh, real quick, we do have you know some mission trips planned for this coming summer. Uh, if you don't mind getting dirty, we're going to go to Massachusetts. Uh, working at a church up there that the building's 153 years old. I've got a few people signed up to go, but I could use a few more. Uh, I've already got the reservations made for us to stay up there. We'll be traveling up, working for the week. We'll be the first team in there, and there'll be four teams that follow us. It's First Baptist, Marlboro, Massachusetts. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. Uh, uh, but they just a small congregation. It's huge. Also, two weeks later, I could use about two or three more people to go to Pennsylvania and help do vacation Bible school. So if you'd be interested in that, uh, travel up there and work with those children. You may have, you know, it might be 10 kids and maybe 20. We don't know. And Pastor, you know, there's some inroads being made in the community, but there's a lot needs to be done. So if you would be interested in that. And then in October, there'll be a group, group, group going up to New Hampshire to help get a camp prepared, prepared and shut down for the winter. And that'll be the first week of October. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all the work. And um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about Sunday nights for the next couple of weeks. Uh, next Sunday night, we will be at the Lake House with the Hedricks, and we'll be enjoying a cookout. So that will be, you saw it in the bulletin, I don't want to just wear you out with details that you can get and, and, and make you uh, immune to announcements, but that'll be next Sunday night, and we won't be here. If you come, you, I praise God for you, but you will be quite alone. And unless someone else isn't paying attention right now. Uh, and so, you know, the folks that aren't here at this point, which is like two-thirds of our folks, they, they will need to read the bulletin. So then let's talk about the Sunday after, which is the 5th, I think so, the 5th of June. That sounds right. We also will not have a Sunday evening service because we have VBS starting that evening. Uh, instead, there will be Adult Vacation Bible School. I think Walter Creighton will be leading that this, this week, this year. And so that will follow. Okay. Are there any other, does anyone else have a testimony they'd like to give? Anyone at all like to testify the Lord? Go ahead, Joey. We had a, an accident yesterday that could have had a, a bad outcome. And 
so as a family, we were able to praise and thank God for the outcome that we did have. And uh, my daughter said, uh, you know, we see a lot in the Bible where people designate days as the time when they observe things. So from now on every year, this day, we'll observe the day that God had his hand on that. Wow. Amen. That's pretty grown up. Amen. There are dates that we don't want to remember, but they're good to remember. Yeah, that's good. Any other testimonies, what God has done or is doing in your family or in your life? Anyone? Okay. Well, that's true. We do appreciate graveside services where we're not getting this amount of moisture. And um, that's, that's a real help. Denny? I just have a question. Okay. Uh, Rick should be released tomorrow after a stress test if it doesn't show anything. Okay. And sure, it depends on him. I mean, we're probably not gonna probably not gonna raid his home if he's not there. But <laughs> I'm not against it. Uh, I just don't know that. Uh, so I expect that we'll be just fine for next Sunday. Thanks for asking. All right, brother, brother Tommy. Amen. It's a good full day. I was really wondering about canceling this evening's service because of the full day. And I thought, you know, there's, I never say, hey, be in your place from now until Friday. We're going to have extended, you know, revival meetings or whatever. I haven't done that since I've been here. And the last time that we had an all day kind of thing was two and a half years ago when Annette Franklin and her funeral. And there's Brother Michael right now. He remembers that day, no doubt. And we had the, basically the same thing. So these, uh, these are infrequent, thank God. Uh, and at the same time, uh, they're good to do every now and then, to, just, to, just to ruggedize ourselves a little as Christians and do something all day. Anyway, any other announcement, or testimonies or announcements? Any at all? Okay. I'd like you, before Ronnie comes to read, I'd like you to look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're going to build on this morning's thought about our happy God. And... Um, you can see what our title is tonight, and I don't want to sound like uh, Uncle Phil, or what is it? Is it Uncle Phil on the Duck Dynasty? It's, we're not just happy, happy, happy all the way around here, but we do want to stay with the theme and see what God is saying through the passage this morning and then now into this evening's passage. I have you in Timothy in the evening, and it's not to speak out of Timothy. I want to show you something before... Brother Ronnie reads the evening passage. So take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want you to see how the 6th chapter begins. And um, I want you to find 1 Timothy 6. And uh, do you need the page number? Brother, have you got it? 1457. Thanks, Brother Shannon. And I'd like us to pray. Can we do that? Heavenly Father, I come before you this evening thanking you for these dear folks that are here. I am also thankful for the strength you've given me now to, uh, to speak once, one more time. I pray that you would um, take away any kind of distractions that I have, which at this point are manifold. I pray that you would please uh, bless your people this evening with um, more of an awareness and illumination of your word a, the grasping of a concept. Help us, dear God, to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might as we learn one more time at your feet. I pray that you'd be with some who are not with us tonight because they're sick. I think of Darren, who's normally with us, but is feeling very, very uh, sick. I pray that you'd raise him up. I think of Brother Rick Hedrick. I think about how uh, awaiting a stress test tomorrow in is, is in itself a level of stress, no doubt. I pray that you would please prepare him, and I pray that if there are any problems, that they, that they will be uncovered, and that he will see what needs to be taken care of. And then, Lord, we also ask you to bless Glenn Coslin this evening uh, over in Fry Hospital, same hallway as Rick. I pray that you would touch his, his, um, his body today as well, and may tomorrow be a day of release for him, just as we hope it is for Rick. Then lastly, Lord, uh, and certainly not least, we ask you to continue to bring salve to the souls of the Beasleys and now help the Houstons as they look forward to a service with you on Wednesday. 
I pray that you would uh, please give those who will be speaking in that service some level of clarity, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 1 Timothy 6, I want you to notice how the chapter begins. Let as many bondservants as are under the yoke count their own master worthy of all honor. That seems like a really odd requirement for people that are owned. You know, we want you to count your masters worthy of all honor. That's odd. In fact, there's a lot of people that probably are thinking, you know, Paul, if now is, now's a good time to just outlaw slavery in the churches. That, come on, Paul, just say it. But I think that you're going to, by the end of this evening, and it will not be long, to quote uh, Liz Taylor after her fifth husband, I won't keep you long. Um, I, I think probably what I want you to see is why Paul didn't hurry up and say, hey, y'all, sell your slaves. Now, we have talked about this about seven months ago. We actually dealt with this on a Sunday night. And if you want more information about why slavery exists at all in the Bible, I'm not at all. I'm hoping you're not leaving this building thinking, oh, there he is. He thinks slavery is a thing that ought to be exercised. I don't. I don't. But what I do want you to take note of is that Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, probably didn't own a slave. And here he says, hey, bond servants, I want you to count your masters worthy of all honor. And verse 2, those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. So you have this idea of teach and exhort. You have this idea of slaves and their masters. Now, you'll notice in verse 3, if anyone teaches otherwise. Okay, this is kind of a repeat from chapter 1. We have a, a, a recursive theme here. It keeps showing up. Teach the right stuff. And he puts that right on the heels of how slaves and masters should interact. We should take careful note that Paul has an opinion of right teaching. And, and I think it's unique, and I think you should too, that this right teaching is buttressed up against slaves and masters. I mean, he's either audacious or just plain rude. He's just dealt with slaves and masters and then says, verse 3, if anyone teaches anything than what I've just said that, you know, then make sure, verse 4, you understand he's proud knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes, arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, revelings, evil suspicions. So granted, there's more to the doctrine of Jesus than how you treat your slave or how you see your master. But Paul puts those in a connection one with the other. Basically, like I said this morning, there is nothing in our lives that the gospel in some manner doesn't touch. Uh, in some way, the truth of what Jesus did and why he did it actually affects the way that we look at ourselves in difficult situations, such as being owned. And, okay, so he says, if, if you find someone that doesn't teach this right, you just know that you're dealing with a pompous windbag, verse 4. That's the Bill Sturm. Uh, he's proud. Uh, that's the Bill Sturm translation. Then verse 5, useless wranglings of men, corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. Look, we have already, John Moore preached a good sermon on this on a Sunday night, I think about a year ago. So I don't want to do that again. We're not going to cover these verses again. But notice it just keeps on talking all the way through the verses. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Verse 13, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. And before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. That, that was Paul's eschatology right there. Whenever he's ready, he'll return. He who is, what? He who is the blessed and only potentate or the only sovereign. Now think about it. I, I don't think that Paul wasted words. Carefully consider how Paul describes Jesus. He says, end of the verse, King of kings, Lord of lords, verse 16, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. And then he gives us doxology, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. You can almost hear the organ. So you notice that on this list of things that he calls Jesus Christ, and we know we're talking about Jesus Christ because in verse 13 it says so. And then in verse 14 it says so again. 
And you see that which, W-H-I-C-H, at the beginning of verse 15, which he will manifest in his own time. We haven't changed to God the Father. We're not back to God the Father. We're talking about this one who will appear, Jesus. So this is really interesting. Notice, please, again, like this morning, how Paul describes him. He who is the blessed and only potentate. If you weren't here this morning, for whatever reason, I think most of you were looking around the room, it will not surprise you to know that this is that same word translated happy in different parts of the Bible. Just imagine describing Jesus Christ as the cheerful one who's returning, the happy one, and he, he's a happy sovereign. But that is exactly how he's described here. A happy potentate, blessed and only potentate. He's king of kings and lord of lords. This is not an angry despot. Will he come back and thump the kings of the earth? Yes. And he'll do it happily. You're not going to ruin his day when he has to walk through your blood on the way to the gates of Jerusalem. He has to have worse things going on in his day to make him unhappy. What? Isn't that amazing? So I wanted you to see... Uh, Brother Ronnie, would you come up? So I wanted you to see two things in this passage that we looked at. Number one, bond slaves in verse one, and number, uh, verse number 14 and 15, the appearing of a happy Christ. Slavery, the appearing of a happy Christ. Now you're in Titus chapter number two, and Brother Ronnie is going to read chapter two, verses nine through the end of the chapter. Page number, Shannon? 1463. Hear the word of the Lord. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke all with all authority. Let no one despise you. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks, Ronnie. Well, friends, I hope you saw it. His passage began and ended with the very two topics that 1 Timothy 6 did, and this is the connection of the morning and evening passages. You see in chapter 2, verse 9, we're dealing with bond servants and how they treat their masters. And the passage ends with a coming of, a, uh, of Jesus Christ, verse 13, a happy coming, a blessed hope. This is not some sort of beatitude. Uh, well, you know, I feel like I should be listening to like a long-haired hippie-looking Jesus uh, with a British accent, blessed are the potent spirits, and we have no idea what it means. No, this is literally Paul saying we're looking for a happy event. And it makes sense that it's happy because it involves two people. You see, in verse 13, it is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Some have thought that this is saying that Jesus is our God and Savior. I don't have a problem with that, but that's not necessary. Think about what you know if you were at the graveside service, the passage that I quoted in 1 Thessalonians 4. Listen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. So the Lord descends from heaven... And who's blowing the trumpet? So father and son are both at the rapture and the resurrection. I mean, if that's not good enough, think about the night of Jesus' arrest when he tells Caiaphas, you will see the Son of Man coming on the right hand of power. You see, there will be two present. And so you should find no problem... When you read in 1 Timothy 1, you have a happy God. You read in 1 Timothy 6, you have a happy son of God. 
It should not then be any surprise to you in Titus 2.13, you have a happy coming. And uh, I think that that is just great. So I have a list of topics for us to talk about. But first, what do you want to talk about? What's on your mind tonight? Any questions so far? Rolf. Well, uh, the answer to your question is yes, there is certainly a difference between someone who indentures himself, indentures himself to pay off a debt or to not have to be sold to a foreigner. And if I think if I understand your question, there's a difference between that person and someone who is purchased from a different country. Um, I think the argument, though, is that is, are either one of them okay? Um, of course, William Wilberforce would say, no, neither one of them is okay. You should not own another man. And in that British government context, right on, William, we're with you. But as it applies to the Hebrew context or the first century Greco-Roman context, there was a, I don't want to say more dignified, but it will help me feel a lot better if I could say something like less undignified, which is the same thing, but it makes me feel better a less undignified form of slavery where, yes, you're sort of owned by someone. And, and I don't know if it's occurred to you, but we still have that kind of reality in today's world. Uh, it's called the military. Um, basically, if orders are issued, guess what? I don't get a vote. And as much as I love you, you don't either. Uh, I'm owned. I have this ID card that says you are the property of the United States government. So, and how about people like George Beverly Shea, who was not allowed to sing any old place he wanted to. Uh, when he, in the 1920s, was approached by a record company from Ottawa, Canada, they wanted to own the rights to his voice. And he had a choice. Can I still sing in church whenever I want to and remain relatively poor? Or do I sign this contract and I cannot even sing in my own local church? His voice would have been owned and anyone that understands copyrights understands that in some degree there is some ownership of another person. But, my goodness, I don't want to act like this is no big deal. But thank you for bringing that, that nuance into this conversation. All righty. Well, if there's nothing more, let's get into some conversation. First, let's talk about the two appearings for Paul, Titus, and the Cretans. I want you to notice how he uses the word in chapter 2 in verse number 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. If you're here Wednesday night, this should really get your antennas uh, actuating. Because this seems to say that the grace of God has appeared to all men. I mean, there should be some smiles out there because that's exactly what it says. There's no seam to it. I figured that out when I learned phonics. You can sign the words out and they sound exactly like what they look at on the page. That is exactly what it says. The grace of God has appeared to all men. And you'll notice over there in uh, chapter 3, verse number 4, when the kindness and the love of our God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So hopefully you can see that in Paul's perspective, God's grace has appeared to all men. Now, in fairness, I think it's important for us to have a conversation that I would want had if I was in your seat, and that is the use of the word all. Uh, I've said it before. I'm going to keep on saying it. We have several different contextual, nuanced understandings of the word all. For example, if we turn the cameras off on the internet and I said, hey, everyone's invited over to our house for ice cream, that means everyone in here, right? So you have an understood context because you're here that when I say everyone, I don't mean everyone on the planet can come to my house for ice cream. I would have a really bad attitude about that idea. So there's an understood context that if I'm in a room with a bunch of people and I say, all y'all getting on my nerves, I'm not speaking to the public. I'm speaking to the people in the room. And here, Paul says, the grace of God has appeared to all men. Now, 
we don't want to play gymnastics with the words either. We want to be really honest with it. And the beautiful thing about this word all is that it has other, other appearances in this passage. For example, you might notice in verse number nine, exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things. Question for you. If you're at one of the churches in Crete, would you be happy that Paul wrote that if you owned one of the bond slaves? I hope that you would be happy that Paul wants your bond slave to obey you in all things. I would hope that you would think that Paul is not telling your servant that they can think of all the exceptions to the word all. So if in verse 9, all means each and every individual, we probably shouldn't try to change definitions in two verses. So... When you find out in verse 11 that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, you should believe that. There are other verses like John chapter 1, verse 9. Christ is the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. That's a really powerful thing. And right now, hopefully, you're thinking deeply like, how does the grace of God appear to every every person how well i think it'd be helpful to say that if it were effectual if we could say that word no i don't want to use that word so i won't let me pull that back whatever this is it means that mankind has god actively postured towards grace towards them now again let's remember the argument the argument is that if all means each and every in verse 9, and the bond servant is supposed to be pleasing to the master in each and every thing, and not some kind of general thing, hey, make sure you obey all kinds of stuff your boss tells you to do tomorrow, but don't obey each and everything he tells you to do. I hope that we would have a problem with that usage of all. So by the time we get to verse 11, we want to say that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. I want to bring some help from Paul from another passage. Now listen, this is not typical for me, but when I feel like a passage is explained better by a biblical author, I don't want to hazard an explanation myself. I think that's a little silly. I can sit here and tell you, well, here's what I think, but when Paul himself, in the only other book that mentions Titus, or at least one of the other books outside the pastoral epistles, the only other book outside Timothy and Titus that mentions Titus, the person, when that book explains this passage, well, then I would like to go and see what it says. So Acts is not the book. Remember, Titus is not mentioned by name in the book of Acts. So go with me to 2 Corinthians. Let's see if we can get some, let's see if we can get some clarity on what it means for God's grace to shine on all, each and every person that enters into the world. So 2 Corinthians, you're just paging back towards the beginning of the Bible, but not too far. You're looking for basically 2 Corinthians, and you're looking for chapter 4. The big numbers are the chapters, the little numbers are the verses. And I want you to take specific, specific notice of chapter 4, and I want you to notice verse number three. And then I'm going to see if I can, um, maybe with some streamers, do an interpretive dance for you up here and demonstrate what I think is being said. You're welcome. All right, so no, I will not, but I'll try to use big motions with my hands as though I were landing a plane, and I will try my best to, um, to make this clear. Notice in chapter four, verse three, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus our Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So here, as we looked at Wednesday night, we're just flashing back to just remind you what we read. 
apparently those who have the light shined into their hearts, verse 6, become believers. It says in verse number 4, the God of this world has blinded their minds who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, look at verse 4, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So it appears that God's grace appears to all men, but that they, because of their blinded minds, are not sure what they're looking at. Do you see this? So it takes more than having the light shined on you, verse 4, you need the light shined in you, verse 6. Do you see this? Apparently, all people, again, using that contextual understanding of all in Titus 2, apparently all people have God's grace, we might call it light, shined on them, that if their eyes were opened, they would respond without fault to their conscience, to creation, and to the gospel truth in the stars. But because their eyes are blinded, they need sovereign grace to pierce their dark heart, according to verse 6. So it's one thing to have the light shined on you. It's another thing to have the light penetrate your heart. So Titus 2 says that there is a common grace. All people on the planet see God's grace and it teaches them something. But that doesn't mean that it actually saves them. And the answer for why it doesn't save them automatically, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, is because their eyes are blinded and their mind is veiled. So again, it's the, the problem in, I, man, there are so many people that I wish were in their places tonight because this would help so many people. It's, this is not an issue of God doesn't want some people saved. His grace shines on all men. The problem is the blind hearts of people that don't respond to this general grace of God. And that is why we say there's enough revelation in creation and in the conscience to damn you on the day of judgment. And that only ones who are saved are the ones, according to verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4, that God speaks light into the heart. He sovereignly overcomes the resistance of the blind eyes and the veiled heart. If God allows every person to have what they want, they'll go to hell. So he interrupts it and speaks light into the heart in verse 6. It's the difference between showering someone with grace and injecting them with grace. If you're showered with it, it runs off of you. It's nice. The experience is wet and refreshing. But you need grace injected. And that is the difference between the grace of God that appears and the grace of God that saves. All right. I'm a little worked up. I get that. But what do you think? Any questions for clarity? We'll be back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The God of this age, the God of this eon, the God of this world. So he's blinded. He's, he's blinded them. That's right. Yeah, he is that. He gets the credit for blinding the persons who are perishing. And uh, just so we understand, this is. The Lord will never put someone in the lake of fire because they were blinded by Satan. He'll put them there because they are willful unbelievers whose names are not in the book of life. So that's, that is uh, Titus. We're going to go back to Titus chapter 2 now. Go back to where we were, and that is two appearings. We're halfway through number one, and we have five minutes left. All right? <laughs> Friends, I'm not apologizing for none of that. Because I think that on Sunday nights, that's sort of my point, is let's just go at whatever speed we go through. And uh, we're going to try to get to number three and then sing in five minutes or, or something. I don't know. So, but we're in Titus 2, and you'll notice, now that we've talked about the first appearing, 
1a, we see that the grace of God appeared to all men, verse 11. And when it does, it saves some in verse uh, verses 4 and 5 of chapter 3. You see how the kindness of God, our love, kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. And you'll notice that at the end of verse 5 of chapter 3, that the Holy Spirit is what does the regenerating. I mean, I don't know how many of you have planted anything recently. I have not. I totally thief. I buy all the stuff from Lowe's and just put it right in the yard. I don't, but the idea of a seed germinating is it's dead. And we don't really know what makes it come alive. We can blame water, we can blame the right temperature of the soil, we can blame the nutrients in the soil, but for all intents and purposes, the seed is dead, and we don't know what causes it to come alive. So also, at the end of Titus chapter 3, verse 5, regeneration, a new genealogy, a new generation. You see that? Don't, don't zone, we only got four or five more minutes. Focus, end of verse 5, the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So, what causes the person to see light that's appearing to him? The Holy Spirit bringing him to life, bringing her to life, regeneration. The Holy Spirit awakens someone, mind is unveiled, eyes are unblinded, they see the grace of God that's appearing to all men, and they are saved by mercy, according to 3.5. So he uses that word appearing, and now look what he does in verse 13. You've already had the grace of God appear to you. Now you're looking for a blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I can tell you right now, this is all we're going to get to. That word looking at the beginning of verse 13 is often seen as this kind of idea of doing this. And that's fine. There are, there are several passages like that in the New Testament. Matthew 24, Matthew 25, 13 with the ten virgins. Matthew 26, verse 40, uh, when it talks about uh, um, Joseph of Arimathea looking or watching. Revelation 3, 3, watch and keep your garments white. So that is the word uh, grego, uh, gregoret, and it is a word that means to look, to watch. And it is... Um, it's an act of looking for. It's like you're sitting on the front porch watching for dad to pull in the driveway. That's that word. But that's not the word here. The word for looking here and, uh, is a different word. It's prosdecomai, uh, prosedecomai. It's a combination of two Greek words. It means to take to yourself with the hand. It's used, and this will be helpful for you. You might want to write these down. I don't know. Joseph of Arimathea waiting for the kingdom of God. That's the word here, waiting at the beginning of verse 13. Or Simeon waiting for the consolation of Israel, Luke 2.25. That's the word here in Titus 2.13. Or uh, men who are waiting for their Lord to return from a wedding, Luke 12.36. That's the word here, waiting. It's an active waiting. It's a postured waiting. Or if I could say it in today's language, it means to look forward to something. Now, in case you're thinking that I'm just making that up, I wonder if anyone has an NIV in the room. Can you read verse 13? While we wait for the blessed hope. How about an NRSV, New Revised Standard Version? Anyone have that? How about an ESV? Anyone have that? Please read verse 13, the ESV. Anyone have a net Bible in here? Net Bible, N-E-T. How about an RSV, Revised Standard Version? All those versions have waiting for the blessed hope and glorious appearing. Why do they have waiting? Because that is the word in the original in 2.13. It's not that we're not looking for the happy return of Christ, a happy hope. It's that we're actively waiting for it more than we're gazing at a horizon for it. So this is how this works. I am not watching for Christmas right now, and here's why. I know Thanksgiving has to happen first. I know Fourth of July has to happen first. I know that Father's Day has to happen first. I know that May 23rd has to happen first. So I can look forward to Christmas, but I'm not looking for Christmas. 
It's two different words. And this word is the looking forward to or waiting. It's a postured waiting. It's like you expect it to happen, you're prepared for it to happen, you're waiting for it to happen, but that doesn't mean it has to happen immediately because you're not looking for it, you're looking forward to it. Check me out on it, I got nothing to hide. And that is why most of the translations translate it waiting for the blessed hope. And so in the interest of full disclosure, one with the other, we need to be very honest. I grew up with an entire group of people that said, I ain't looking for nothing but the rapture. I'm looking for the blessed. Okay, very well. I don't blame you. I'm looking forward to it, but I'm not looking for it first. Because this passage tells us we're waiting for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I can't wait for Christmas. I mean, there's something holy about eggnog showing up in all the stores. <laughs> there's something righteous about that. Pumpkin spice after Halloween. Can I get a witness? I'm talking about there's massive amounts of endorphins flooding the neurons in my brain when I think of eggnog. I'm looking for, don't judge me. Some of you are <laughs> judging me. I'm looking forward to it. But here's the problem. We have what we might call in our churches a weight loss, W-A-I-T. And we have decided that we are not going to wait any longer. We're done waiting. If the Lord doesn't bail me out of this problem, then I guess I'm just going to lose hope. There is a reason why we're told to wait for the blessed hope. Because it is our eventual, okay, it's our eventual deliverance. Okay, here's the bottom line. Here we are. Now you know why the last command as it applies to society in the church is about slaves that might otherwise think that their blessed hope is being delivered from slavery. In both books, yes? In both books, you wanna know why Paul didn't outlaw slavery? Do you know why Paul didn't try to take care of all the injustices in society? because he wasn't in society, he was in the kingdom of God. And the Christian's biggest issue is that they think their blessed hope is something they can make happen through social activi uh, activism. Amen. You cannot activism any heart change, but you can wait for a happy hope. And who brings the happy hope? A happy God and his happy son bring a happy hope. And they want us to remember that our ultimate deliverance is not in someone changing the rules to the game, but in someone ending the game. Someone bringing in a new thing. So while we're busy rescuing trafficked children, and we ought to, while we're as busy doing mission work, and we ought to. While we're busy standing up for the oppressed, and we ought to. We are not naive enough to think that that will scratch the itch in the believer who is desperate for deliverance. We're waiting for our hope. A postured endurance. We're not hoping that maybe that check comes in the morning to deliver us. We know that ultimately our happiness comes ultimately when Christ comes and brings the end of all hope with him. Will you stand with me? The music is playing, we're praying. You talk to God about what he said to you.
Uh, Brother Tommy, will you close the service tonight with a prayer?